place here who joins us for dinner is worth the recognition. And I'd like to um, introduce as one of our special guests, the president of Ball State University, Dr. John Worthen, and welcome him. I'd also like to introduce the provost. Well, I don't think he's here. I think he's going to be late. John Fleck is here, one of our loyal supporters, the director of the um, Public Works Division of the State of Indiana. I'd like to recognize uh, John. Another, another one of our supporters, Ewing Miller, the president of our Connex Division of HNTB in Indianapolis. Is Ewing here? He was in the hall. Here he is, Ewing Miller. Good to see him. And on a trip down a um, very sentimental lane, I'd like to introduce Richard Pollack, who was the first person I met when I came here to Muncie on the original faculty of the College of Architecture of Ball State, the original partner of Browning Day and Pollack, now Browning Day Mullins and Deerdorf. Mullins and Deerdorf are two of our alumni, and Dick is very much responsible for changing the face of Indianapolis with hotels and all kinds of new landscaping and the Hoosier Dome and a bunch of pro projects that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. He's now Vice President of Architecture and Planning at R.V. Welch Company in Carmel, Indiana, Dick Pollack. And the gentleman that just waved to Dick, Steve Mannheimer, who's an architecture critic for the Indianapolis Star and who teaches at uh, the Heron Art School in Indianapolis. We're happy to have Steve with us, too. <laughs> Last uh, but not least, one of our alumni from the class of 76, principal of Brandt Associates in Indianapolis, Chris Brandt. Where is Chris? Is he here? All the way in the back. We're happy to have Chris with us. Um, a lot of you have um, probably had a chance to read the lecture announcement outside. Some of you may not have. For the sake of those of you who, who have not read it, I'll just go over a few things on it briefly. Tonight we have the privilege of having two-thirds of the Taft architects with us. They're my favorite two-thirds, I don't mind admitting it. And um, it's because I've known them the longest. It's, it's uh, only fair for me to say that. And, 18 years, 18 years. We, we met when we were both going through puberty, and it's been a friendship ever since. <laughs> um, the, the Taft Architects, as you know, are a group of three individuals whose uh, collective effort has resulted in some fairly amazing projects. Esquire magazine has included them in their register of the best of the new generation. Uh, they joined uh, the likes of um, Apple Computer Whiz, Steve Johns, and actress Meryl Streep, and were listed among 200 and, how many? 272 individuals from the United States. There were very few architects in that list, and the three of them were included. And I wrote down what the editor of Esquire magazine said. They said the purpose, they're very humble. They're very humble. Danny Samuels here used to drive a Studebaker. Now he drives a Maserati, but he's still very humble. It's true. The, the editor of Esquire magazine said the purpose of this compendium was to show that there are new ideas in these times and there are American heroes and there is more to this generation than narcissism and self-interest. Two-thirds of those American heroes are right here. I think we're fortunate to have them with us. They've done a variety of projects and I think they'll describe those to you. Uh, they've received over 31 awards, including three consecutive honor awards from the American Institute of Architects. Um, they've published widely, and their work has been exhibited all over Europe and the United States. Uh, last year, they were William F. and Charlotte Shepard, Davenport Professors of Architecture. Shepard, you didn't have that in your bio data, but I looked it up. Davenport Professor of Architecture at Yale for the fall semester of 1984, and they served as critics at Harvard and Penn and a number of other schools and, and, and on juries and honor awards juries. They have recently been awarded the Rome Prize. The Rome Prize is the most prestigious fellowship in architecture, uh, allowing them to undertake a six-month period of advanced study in Rome. And as far as I know, uh, this is the first time in the history of the Rome Prize that it's been given to three individuals who 
um, as they do their work collectively, will share the prize collectively. As I mentioned, um, Bob on my right and Danny and I have known each other for quite a while, for 18 years. Um, they were, when I met them, students, and so was I. They were great guys then. Danny had a Studebaker, but he's still a great guy. And um, uh, they're great guys now. I'm really delighted to have them with us here. I think their visit is long overdue. And I would like to turn the rest of the evening over to these two, according to Esquire magazine, I think you might agree, two American heroes. I'm very happy to welcome them to Ball State. Um, Danny Samuels and Bob Timmy. I think that I better just let you give the rest of the lecture. You're doing such a good job of it so far. It's, it's really quite nice to be here. Uh, every time we're in this state, it seems like uh, we make new discoveries and also uh, renew old friendships and, and uh, meet uh, new people. The kindness which we've already been shown in a few short hours today is quite nice. I think, I think that's why they call the part of this country the heartland of America, and we, we really do appreciate it. Uh, we're going to talk about the work of Taft Architects. And Taft Architects is a collective of three individuals. As Marvin mentioned, uh, Dan, uh, John Kasparian, Danny Samuels, and myself. And what we're going to do is show you a kind of collection of the work in the office. We'll talk about it not so much in terms of a description of the project, but the issues that we think are important and perhaps the process that we think is important that arrived at those issues. One of the things that I think we'll also allude to is how do three people design together? This is a difficult kind of phenomenon that a lot of people don't accept as if it could occur. A lot of people say, well, who really designs the projects in the office? What always amazes us when we talk to these people is how does one person design by themselves? How does one individual in these kind of uh, typical office situation handle the complexity of a project? How do you put up with a client for that long? There are times in which you just want to go away. And it's nice to have a kind of three-man tag team match to hit another one and say, you take them for a while because I've had a little bit too much of them up to now. So there are a lot of aspects of the notion of a collection of designers working together which are, are just quite straightforward and sensible. The three of us, and one of the reasons we're able to work together is the three of us had the same foundation. And oddly enough, we found out that the three of us, although we were born in different parts of the world, John in Alexandria, Egypt, Danny in Perigold, really in Memphis, and then grew up in Perigold, Arkansas, yeah, Memphis, Tennessee, not Egypt. And I was born in, uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, is that we had, and of uh, different cultural and religious background, we had, we had the same parental concerns. We found that our parents are an awful lot alike and that they had the same concerns for us and gave us the same kind of value structure about what's important in a person's life. We met one another in 1965, okay, just after the Civil War in, at Rice University, where we had some wonderful faculty members. Uh, Eleanor Evans, who was a disciple of uh, Joseph Albers, gave us a, an introduction, just a taste, uh, an appetizer of color theory. We had uh, and also a very strong foundation in basic design that later proved to be the thing which allowed us to communicate uh, different kind of experiences with one another. We had the, an individual who's now the president of Caudill, Rowlett and Scott, Paul Kennan, who has been our mentor, who was out of that Saarinen tradition. And Paul taught us concept, which was a very important thing for a beginning student to, to learn. We then separated from one another after graduation and went to different uh, cities and uh, different offices to practice. Danny went to Paris and worked with Guillermo Julian, who took over Le Corbusier's practice and, in particular, the Venice Hospital project. Uh, Danny uh, worked in, uh, in Paris and traveled through Europe. John Kasparian 
went to Los Angeles and worked with Cesar Pelli, who was then working still at Gruen Associates, and also John worked with Craig Hodges and Works West. I went to New York and worked first at the Institute with Peter Eisenman, uh, and then with IM Pay and Partners. We found ourselves back together in Houston uh, in about 1972, 1971 and two, and just happened to start an office. I mean, when you're when you're broke, you can just happen to do things like that, uh, and it doesn't mean quite so much. Uh, because we enjoyed the kind of competitive spirit that we had with one another through school. We had never intended to be partners during school, uh, but we found that we were back in Houston and had a few projects to work on. From that time, the office has grown in size and the complexity of the projects have grown. One of the things about Taft Architects is, is that we try to still maintain large projects with small projects. We'll show you one tonight that uh, we did at the same time we did our largest project, but the total budget of it was $35,000 total construction budget. <clears throat> we have a small office. We intend to keep it a small office. Even though some of our projects are upwards uh, 100 to $150 million projects right now, uh, there are 12 people in the office. There are the three of us, and there are uh, six full-time people, and then we have part-time people who help us uh, from the university. We are beginning to do less and less production drawings and depending more and more about, um, on good associate relationships. Because one of the things that we do not want to be is managers. That tends to limit the amount of work that we can do uh, in the office, but I think that's not uh, the volume is not as important to us as the quality of the work. To tell you a little bit about a typical day, the three of us uh, sit down in the morning about 9 o'clock. We procrastinate for about 30 minutes upwards to an hour, two hours, <coughs> trading video cassettes, talking about what we did the night before trying to keep from having to make any des design decisions. All of, don't tell anybody, don't tell our employees this. We go down to the conference room and they think we're working down there during all of this. And then we start talking about design. And then we work on design as long as it takes. And then the people who work with us, who are very skilled architects, come down. And we discuss the design issues with them. They <coughs> continue to work for the rest of the day and then we go off to uh, in John and Danny's case, Rice University, in my case, University of Houston, to really have fun and teach architecture. With that, as a kind of background, I'd like to quickly get, maybe get into the slides and talk about some issues and some projects. One of the, th if we could have some slides, perhaps, and also uh, uh, the lights out. <laughs> Help. This is a slide to, to prove that there actually was both photography in the mid-60s and also that we are, were students during that period of time. Uh, I, I don't think Marvin's in this shot unless he's behind the lady in the middle up there. Um, let me see, I can operate these things right here. Okay, one of the things that we might talk about is that architecture to us is the complex resolution of the, uh, of the conflicting and complex forces that are at work on a project. Those include aspects of the program, goals and aspirations of the client, goals and aspirations of the architect, the kind of history of the building type that came into it, and uh, the general and specific aspects of the context. We feel that for us, we want to keep all of these issues alive throughout the design process, throughout the architectural process, and into the building itself. So it just doesn't deal with one of these issues or two of them, but the individuals using the building can begin to realize the forces which are at work in those human activities, that building type, that site. It's for this reason that we think that a, a, an understanding of order or structure at a level in which linguistics might talk about as being syntax or deep structure 
is important to us. Early on in the design phase, we will generate a whole series of very small matchbox models, which will talk in three dimensions with clients, building committees, boards, whoever is involved with the project, about various ways of looking at the activities given the site. In this case, you can see it's for a school which uh, went on hold because of economic conditions in which we were quite excited to say is starting back up again outside of Columbus, Indiana, a little Moravian community called Hope. This is an elementary school. You can see the kind of organization here, the kind of classical wings that extended into the forecourt, uh, a scheme which is really about layering of space. Let me see. Whoops, I went. Another scheme which is about uh, a street. Is that thing working? Uh, out of these, very often, what will happen is a synthesis of ideas, because each one of these may have different strengths that different members of the what we call the client or different individuals may see different relationships within. Uh, we may start models this diagrammatic as, as just kind of three-dimensional studies, as in the case of this house in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, starting with the idea of <coughs> circulation, the gallery kind of space, beginning to understand program and massing in relationship to it, developing that into uh, a kind of understanding of wall surfaces and uh, elevations, and then a more complex uh, model uh, dealing with uh, the sense of that space itself. Now what we're going to show is a series of projects and on your left you will see a diagram done after the fact which talks about the major place in the building. Uh, that is the designation of that kind of orange prismacolor building, uh, orange prismacolor on the building itself. It's nice. Um, it's moving. <clears throat> this also goes back and ties in with this notion of order in the, in the arrival at discovery of an importance of the major place within the building and how it relates to the organization of the structure. Perhaps it's easier to talk about this metaphorically uh, than it is architecturally. We feel that there are some very simple organizational techniques that people relate to. Uh, we talk about field organization, and perhaps the metaphor to that or the analogy to that is being in a forest and the idea of being free to wander from one point to another. Architecturally, we see examples of this in marketplaces, in bazaars, in trade fairs, where an individual feels that no one location is more important than any other. This versus linear organization, metaphors are analogies, of course, to this might be the stream or the road. Um, analogous to one's life, and that, of course, is linear organization or the gallery or the spinal systems that we see. And the last deal, deals with centroidal organization, the sense of a place, a center, which has to do with one's home, one's self, one's relationship to one's deity. The interrelationship of these three organizational types, as they begin to play against one another, bring on the kind of complex relationships that can occur in architecture. And in this case, I think you can see that relationship between that which is a linear system and the making of, at the crossing, a special place. Our models uh, become more elaborated. We use, as you can see here, Pantone paper to begin to talk about the materials on uh, this project, which is now complete, uh, the Mixon House. Um, or in this case to talk about materials of a block and uh, vinyl cladding in a house down in Galveston. Or they may become large scale, one half inch, uh, three eighths, one half to three quarter scale uh, as we begin to study interior, uh, interior spaces. We show you a lot of these models at the point in which they are most easily photographed or are best shown in a photographic form. Most of them start as corrugated cardboard or chipboard models, which as the scale demands become elaborated upon. 
and in a lot of cases are destroyed as a result of the design process, pushing the model past uh, the scale which warrants it. We're not historicists, mainly because we weren't trained in that direction. But one of the exciting things in architecture is a rediscovery of learning from <clears throat> the past and trying to understand architecture in a way in which it can continue and built form the values of generations before that we feel are important to carry into the future. Uh, this can be done um, in a number of ways. One, one project here you can see that continues that kind of Victorian fascination in a train sta station with an exterior platform, the relationship between structure and lighting uh, and the alignment and rhythm is con continued in an exhibition system column that continues the line of the structure itself. Um, we do love, I think, to study architecture from the past and history. And the, the most interesting times to us in architecture is when the guys didn't have it all together. When there was a conflict, and you could see that conflict, and they were trying to keep that conflict, the idea of that conflict open in their work. Where there was a kind of ideal, or two ideals perhaps, which represented different polemics which may have occurred, or different poles which may have occurred during the time. Uh, Palladio's work, that, that, uh, uh, that wonderful ability to look at vernacular architecture and classical architecture and create structures which were responsive of both of them. <coughs> or Ledoux, uh, work which was steeped with a kind of social and political overtones, but took classicism and Palladian work to a level of abstraction that uh, didn't uh, point towards minimalism, that didn't strip it of its intrinsic character. Or one of America's greatest architects uh, we have to, we feel at least, is Thomas Jefferson and what he did on the University of Virginia uh, campus, where one sees this kind of machine-like clarity of site plan and organization uh, being um, represented to us in a way in which classical architecture takes on the dignity of education. Sullivan's work, a kind of unifying, organizing, uh, grid work which takes place in the kind of playfulness of materials and terracotta within that framework. Or Macintosh and that uh, ability, again, to see a highly ordered, highly disciplined understanding of building and space at the same time respecting the kind of fluid sensibilities um, which were prevalent during that period. And Otto Wagner, the celebration of technology coupled with that kind of, of celebration of, of nature, as you can see on the uh, building on the right. And Irving Gill, where there's still an understanding in California of the heritage and history, the kind of romantic uh, uh, mission, I mean, planted almost mission-style architecture, but beginning to understand what it meant to do it in concrete, and in some cases, um, precast and tilt wall construction. And the individual that we really see as our grandfather in this whole business is Saren and Elio Saren. And in fact, that uh, tradition, I think, continued into us in awareness through Paul Kennan and Cesar Pelli and a whole lot of people who were schooled in Nero's office. It was that understanding that the context could be created uh, in a, a very strong influence and even to the extent where one could create a, content, a context through a sensibility to the building type and the climate itself. <clears throat> Closer to home, Rice University and the work of Cram Goodhue and Ferguson, we realize, is a strong influence where there's this transformation of a, of a uh, Mediterranean style uh, architecture and something which really makes sense in the climate, these very long thin buildings, single room wide, would allow natural ventilation, but at the same time, there was a richness and celebration of window detail and mass, which was uh, worthy of that as a kind of uh, educational institutional character. And more vernacular, the missions in Texas, and even some of what we feel is wonderful, the roadside buildings that occur in Texas, this kind of grandness of uh, of celebrating scale and the straightforwardness of the nature of the construction. Those are some of the aspects of history that we think uh, are influences, strong influences upon us. Our early work, uh, before it was called, 
adaptive reuse and was really sophisticated was uh, adaptive reuse or remodeling of buildings in Galveston where we would turn old warehouses into apartments and shops uh, on shoestring budgets. We learned an awful lot. That was our, our kind of beginning education in mechanical systems and economy of means. We also learned about the richness of architecture and I think it really started as going in a, in a kind of attempt to rediscover aspects of the past. On the right, you'll see a building by Nicholas Clayton called the True Heart Adrian's Building. During the 60s, this total building was painted white by a fashionable Houston architect at the time and turned into a furniture dealership. Uh, what we had the job of doing was restoring the facade and we had to go back and do uh, samplings, mortar analysis, and even reconstruct <laughs> Uh, from newspaper photographs the value scale of the building and found it to be a magnificent study in complementary color relationships. I think that we learned a respect for the old at this time and tried to learn how to deal with uh, the infusion of new architecture within an older context. Some of our earlier use of color, a kind of representation of the landscape in the peaceful kingdom born which is actually a building that was done for $1.92 a square foot. It was built out of the Watkins Lynn stage, which had been shipped down to Houston. And the Estes House uh, of 1975, in which we departed from white stucco into brown. You can see here two attitudes. On the right, an earlier attitude about a new and an old, a juxtaposition. And on the left, Rockefellers, in which there's still a contrast but the new is seen as a neutral ground which begins to slip into the kind of rich coloration and then conducted a, a sm kind of small scale dialogue with it. The people in the office are a very strong influence because they are in effect additional ideas that are brought into the work. Uh, the, the use of tile was really a case in which we had an individual who had been a ceramicist before she went in, into school in architecture and we wanted to come up with an idea of signage for a building. In fact, it was Quail Valley was one of the first followed by Grove Court. And she said, well, you could do it in tile. She taught us the process, and it is something which has stuck with us, uh, even to the extent that we had a kiln in the office to uh, actually do the execution of these. Fortunately, there are more artisans coming back into uh, the, the profession of architecture. We're, we're even now not uh, worried about specking something like this on a job and because we know that there are enough people around to do tile work and stenciling. And in this case, uh, stenciling, which is a Texas tradition, a way of decorating, becomes a floor carpet and entrance mats in one of the, er, one of the recent projects, adaptive reuse projects in Galveston, uh, the Springer Building. You see also it becomes in the transoms a way of identifying the units themselves. Our early buildings, uh, we were always worried about the permanence of the material, and that's one of the exciting things about moving up a little bit in scale and being able to get away from wood siding or, or stucco, is to use what we call real materials. And I think that's probably a learning lesson on our part, that there are real materials that are not at, that expensive. And you can see the range of contrast here on the left. Uh, terracotta and, some, and a terracotta section that we designed ourselves in uh, Rivercrest Country Club. At the same time we were doing that building, the little Southside Place bathhouse, which was done in split face and uh, an integral colored concrete block. Uh, both buildings, in a way, dealing with a similar kind of discourse of material. We may talk about bilateral symmetry and layering and architectural terms uh, that might seem like it's uh, written by uh, Pevsner rather than uh, 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 by Taft Architects, but in the final analysis, one of the things which we think is so important about buildings is the day-to-day -day use of them. The most exciting thing for us is to kind of see the little Quail Valley entrance and realize that it is celebrating um, what had been before a very depressing place for people to work and that the turnover, the job turnover, had been drastically reduced as a result of the making of this building and the providing of lunchroom place for the workers. And the Henley building, which the staircase, although it may have been talking about layering or, or uh, a kind of transformation of mass and figure field relationship, 
The fact that it is the origin of the candlelight profession, uh, the procession in Galveston at the Dickens Festival attended by 60,000 people each year uh, is the most important thing of all. We feel that architecture ultimately has to come down uh, uh, to that, and really it may be a case of come up to that level where people can uh, uh, appreciate it for the human activities which can take place. We really enjoy coming and being able to talk to uh, at universities such as Ball State and doing sometimes uh, theoretical competitions. It allows us sometimes to poke fun, sometimes to learn. In this case, a late entries competition for the Chicago Tribune Tower uh, in which we um, saw the, the design of the high rises basically right now the same as it's always been that design of a shaft base and capital and for people, designers who can't make up their minds, paper doll cutouts. Um, the Yale show in 19, 1980 was the first time in which we had used shadow boxes because we realized that models very often when you present them give this feeling of omnipotence or massive roofs looking down upon them. Uh, we did a number of studies for this show, which was a drawing show. We did pop-up models, was the first set that we went through where you pull down a door, but found that there was probably more fascination with the mechanics of the technique than the spaces which were revealed. And looked at this uh, idea of presenting different modeling techniques, the Y over there, which is very thin in a series of layers. And uh, in fact, this was the first time that we tried the false perspective models. Uh, after Scamozzi uh, stage addition to Teatro Olimpico in which the space that one looks into is diminished in a false perspective. What was 30 inches in actual scale was diminished to 16 inches of depth in this box and later at the Venice uh, Biennale competition uh, is a four inch thick false, pers false perspective. Um, our most recent competition, we were quite proud to have been invited by AD to build a doll's house for children because very often people want to bring their children to the office to play with our models. Uh, and it's an interesting thought, uh, briefly. Um, we chose the Talbot House because there was a real sense of love that we had for the project and we saw that as something with a scale that could be transformed, at least a part of it, into a doll's house. We learned a lot about, about some techniques of model making. We actually spent a lot of time reading and talking about children's perception of space and how they could use something. Then this, this was auctioned off, sent to England, in which it received an honorable mention and was auctioned off uh, for the Save the Children Fund, which we were quite, uh, quite proud of. The first of the series of projects that we're going to talk about deal with a sense of layering of space. Uh, and it's that idea of perhaps linear organization or the relationship with the street as being primal. This, these became the offices of the Galveston Historical Foundation and it was Henley Row, as the arrow shows there, in Galveston. Four buildings of a warehouse which was constructed in 1860, which because their neighbor was missing, began to, uh, the party wall, the end party wall began to fall over and it moved away from the joists as much as 11 inches. Our problem was the adaptive reuse or remodeling of the space and at the same time stabilization of that wall. The concept um, that we used after a series of options for uh, looking at this building was to buttress the wall, uh, which was an engineering concept, but it was to buttress this wall with a series of steel bents, almost like flying buttresses, which could have space within them, space necessary to provide for um, the necessary additional fire stair of the building and all of the services which were non-Victorian, which allowed us to move into the building itself and restore it uh, to its original condition since it had been office space in the 1860s. Um, as you can see, the stair not only provides access to, this, to the floors up above, to take you up to what uh, is a kind of roof garden area from the uh, connecting from the strand. Um, we studied a long time this side elevation and realized that there were a whole series of buildings before here, before these buildings, which were actually earlier Texas buildings with stairs attached to the side. And in fact, there was a ghost. Very often you could see the ghost of earlier buildings and stairs next to uh, the buildings themselves. 
the building became uh, a reversal of complements of the front of the building with, as you can see, modeled by these two Galvestonians, tile on the um, um, tile on the side of the building in a windmill pattern that respected the stair, which was actually the color uh, combination of the color of the brick of the Henley Row and the uh, the kind of beige color of an ice house, which was the adjacent building on the next side. Uh, the trim color of the building we found was a wonderful kind of forest green. We picked up that color and let it be the body color of the building with neutral gray turning the corner between the two compositions. Moving inside, we were able with the addition of a little Victorian action office furniture to allow the space to continue almost uh, the way it was uh, originally. And since the joist ran perpendicular to the wall, all services and duck runs were able to be hidden uh, within the, the uh, roof sandwich itself. Uh, we like showing this slide uh, because it shows us, uh, again, one of the kind of lessons we learned from the Victorians, this real sensibility to scale. And it's not a, it's not a sensibility that says that everything has to be scaled uh, the way you think it should be. It says that maybe some things are grander than they should be, and maybe some things are smaller than they should be. Very often, the combination of these two things make things delightful kind of dwell on one's feelings and remembrances of childhood and tables being at eye height and things like that. And this, if you look at this, what, this, what you're looking at is a large base molding. You can tell by the scale of the brick, which is about a 16-inch base molding, and then a little fireplace, which is set into this. It's the relationship, the kind of sensibility to coloration. And the way this is all pulled together as an important event in the room that one could see the activity which would be associated with it, walking up and warming oneself and uh, really beginning to feel an uh, important part of the space. Uh, one of the projects that we did, the little Quail Valley Municipal Utility District office building, uh, this is one that uh, three other architects in Houston had turned down because it's, an, it's a lunchroom addition to a sewer plant. And they thought that sounded terrible, but they said, why don't you call Taft Architects? Those guys will do anything. Um, and so we were, uh, we were interviewed for the job and did the job. It was a very small budget, 1,000 square feet, a little over that, and, and uh, $47,000 was the total budget. This is a facility on a golf course um, in a nice neighborhood, and they didn't like seeing the treatment plant. We realized we couldn't deal with the whole treatment plant, but what we could do is take the massing of the building, the coloration of the existing plan, and transform it in this kind of entrance gateway, a new addition, to uh, uh, give a different meaning, uh, looking at some of the Ledoux work and some of the WPA projects. Basically, it sets up a series of layers, structural layers, that redefine the entrance, and a core separates an office from the uh, lunchroom area itself. You can see at the entrance here on the golf course that it picks up the coloration of the existing buildings, heightens them um, with more saturated colors. Um, this was the first time that we had actually explored using multiple colors and material to give two scales to the building itself. That sense that you see here of the layers and the deep entrance continue into the inside as structural members um, and with the windows that step up in the lunchroom uh, itself. Taking that a little further is Grove Court townhouses, which set up a series of layers which are really gateways or entrances into some very simple townhouse structures. Because of the trees on the site and primarily a main uh, pecan tree in the center um, uh, of the site, the houses were shifted to accommodate uh, in front and rear courts those existing, uh, existing trees. The layers, as they move across the site, slip into the units themselves to define uh, entrance areas. The planes create this kind of, uh, of symbolic entrance sense. Uh, and what we were really trying to do here was give common space to the units so that one could identify the total group uh, rather than uh, individual units on the street, which had been the case uh, in Houston. So you can see gates allow for privacy, which 
they have a lot of parties in this complex, can be opened up and people can flow in and out of the units themselves. I mentioned that some of these photographs are courtesy of Hedrick Blessing and Metropolitan Home. As so one moves inside the units, there's a lot of the kind of character of the Galveston townhouses, uh, the Galveston adaptive reuses that I think we've found uh, quite wonderful. Double height spaces, uh, central service cores, which economically could make the distinction between dining and living in kitchen areas and bedroom. And what we refer to as the National Beer of Texas here on the table comes with every model. Uh, the last project in this sequence is a small project that we alluded to, Southside Place Bathhouse, which is $35,000 was the total budget on the pro project. It was changing rooms and equipment storage uh, for the small community uh, in, uh, in Houston. But we were very excited by this, the ability to do a small municipal building, which is really the heart of the, which is really the, heart of the community, because this is their, fa their facility. We helped them with the design of the pool itself to create this kind of axes, and then extended the building into what is basically a thickened wall. That one passes through this wall as a symbolic gateway into the total park uh, in general, and more specifically, uh, to the activity areas of the pool itself. Oh, can you go backwards? I don't think they can. Well, we'll, we'll be there in a little bit. So you can see uh, in the slide that entrance is marked with a gateway behind which one finds a pavilion, which is a shade pavilion for mothers uh, to sit under. Uh, as their children are in the little wading pool, which is on axes with this. So you move from the street, up the steps, through the gateway, under the pavilion, and finally to the small pool and out to the larger pool and the diving board. Uh, in fact, the budget was so limited on this that we had to try to be fairly creative. And so in discussions, we realized you don't really need a roof on a changing room for a swimming pool because you're probably going to be wet anyway, and if it rains, you really don't care. So that saved an immense amount of the budget. The building itself is constructed from split-face concrete block uh, and that uh, integral uh, colored uh, concrete block for banding. Uh, the posts that you see there are actually the locations of the showers under the lights. The space steps back away to allow this pavilion to occur. Moving inside that single wipe, you can see that the color begins to make a kind of active dressing changing area. Okay. Well, we caution you that these projects are not in chronological order, but are in fact in kind of an after-the-fact perception of uh, increasing uh, density of space, let's say, that some of these early projects that we've shown you, not early in time, but early in the lecture, uh, deal with a kind of planar organization of layers of space, um, each defined by a plane, uh, an attitude which somewhat, perhaps, grows out of, the, uh, out of the use of models and foam core and the kind of thin materials as well as the kind of thin materials we were working with early on, uh, stud walls and sheetrock and stucco. Uh, as time goes on, but not all at once, because this project, which we're going to show you, is, is, earlier than la is much earlier than the last one you saw, uh, we think we've begun to, begun to understand space as something much deeper and much uh, uh, more uh, centroidal and the possibility of, of making spaces for people that have more of a sense of center to them. One of the uh, first breakthroughs in that regard, but one which use, uses the planar strategy is the YWCA. Um, it was a real breakthrough for us, first of all, because it was a much larger building than we'd done to that point. It had a very nice site in Houston with a south-facing exposure to a parkway system which leads downtown and a north-facing uh, kind of urban or residential edge to it, uh, which is entirely different in character. Um, if I hit the right, whoops, wrong one. 
if we could go back on this one, it would be useful. Uh, what we did is we took the, the kind of small scale functions of the building, what we call the support functions, offices, changing rooms, locker rooms, oh, those are changing rooms, aren't they? Uh, a racquetball, daycare, et cetera, et cetera. And we placed them in a plane, but a 30 foot deep plane, 350 feet long, which uh, modulates density to define the kind of different uh, areas of the building. And we juxtapose that support plane or support building with the two major program areas, that is the multi-purpose room and the swimming pool pavilion, which become kind of free pavilions in space. Oh, sorry. Um, each of the pieces, each of the pavilions, and uh, we see the support building also as, as, as a building in a sense, uh, is defined by a characteristic uh, color and, mater and material treatment. The, uh, in the back, the multi-purpose room is a gray building with blue banding. The swimming pool pavilion is a buff building with gridding on it. The support building is defined by the 350-foot-long uh, red plane. But on the front of the building, the kind of public front, uh, the, the red plane steps down to form a chair rail, a wainscot, and up over the entrances, and the other materials also recur as the upper parts of this. Uh, the major entry into the building and the motto of the YWCA is a gateway to experience. We took that very literally, it being not only a gateway from the urban side to the, to the park setting, from the north to the south, but also from the city to the kind of um, uh, the diverse activities that they have within. A separate office facility, which needed its own identity and entrance at a much smaller scale. And then smallest of all, at four and a half feet high, the children's entry into the daycare area, which allows children in and excludes the adults from the children's realm. But each entrance being defined by the stepping up of that uh, of that red band. On the back side of the building, the red band is seen as continuous and the separate pieces of the building play off very distinctly against that. You can see on the left-hand side the multi-purpose room, on the right-hand side the swimming pool, and squeezing out in between in blue tile a special element from the inside which is uh, uh, a ramp that not only provides handicap access from first to second floor, but also becomes the real center of this center space. And for us, this is the real discovery on this project. One passes through, or in this photograph, is passing through the 30-foot thick plane, a thicker plane than we'd ever used before. But beyond that, one finds a kind of centralized space, a kind of outdoor space formed by buildings, or a sense of outdoor space, uh, a kind of piazza. And the, a uh, ramp which ascends through it provides uh, viewing from various levels into the activities which really totally surround this space. The multi-purpose room used for everything from athletics to banquets to dances to uh, 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 lectures which open up by garage doors to the central space. The ramp which ascends up and when you hit the landing you overlook the parkway system to the south the most dramatic point, we think, in the building. And then as you proceed upward, you look into the swimming pool pavilion, here seen in a model form, um, which also has garage doors which open it up to the south, and in the summertime allows for cross ventilation, and the wintertime allows for sunbathing on the south side of the building. Um, proceeding upward, then, the real sense of that space as the center, the perception of the uh, wrapping of the exteriors of each of the buildings onto the inside and promoting as much as possible the sense that that's, that's an exterior space at the center of the thing and really the center of all the activities. Within the support building, some of the uh, ideas from the front of the building are repeated at smaller scales, the kind of, uh, it's been ca uh, called the wandering dado line, which goes up and down over uh, telephone booths and water fountains and entries to racquetball courts. But the perception at all times as you move through the space always of the red plane and the relationship that the other two pavilions have to it. 
a very recent building just completed, which we think takes the idea of a centralized space even further, is another building for a municipal utility district, this time north of Houston instead of south of Houston, and this time a 10,000 square foot office facility, which eventually, or for the present, uh, next 10 years or so, will function as the city hall for this little community, the Woodlands in Houston. Uh, the community has very strong uh, restrictions about utilization of natural land, and the location and, and essentially footprint of the building was was almost predetermined by building setback lines, which uh, essentially gave us a very, very tight triangular site. Uh, what we did, in, once again after an elaborate investigation of alternative types, is to emphasize the civic functions of the building as a kind of central space which slides through and is treated totally different than the surrounding office space, which is pretty much straightforward. Uh, the, the central pavilion you can see is, has a pitched roof, uh, has the sense of a mega onto it. It's a colonnade that terminates in the most important public function, the boardroom, where public policy for the water district is decided. Um, and much to the credit of the board of directors, uh, they saw the building really as they wanted to make a civic statement and not just do a regular office building. On the other hand, it's totally surrounded, or most of the program of the building is standard office space. And we treated that uh, once again in this, in this kind of wrapper that wraps all the way around and inside to define two more separate buildings. Um, in this case, a masonry uh, a wrapper that's done with, a, with banding of the split face block with a very, very civic red brick and you can see the central pavilion sliding out between those. There is a grid work of uh, mullions and control joints done in a green tone that plays in and out of both the exterior brick wrapper and the interstices between it, and uh, in, a, in a sense announces that as being the kind of central space. To the uh, west of the building and opposite the public entry is what in the next 20 years perhaps is going to be a river walk system and the building had to also have the possibility of opening up to that side and, uh, and eventually be totally accessed if necessary from that side. Um, within the, the public space done in very simple materials, uh, very low budget once again as most of our projects are, but trying uh, with the scale of the space and the use of the materials to impart something more than ju what the, just the sum of the pieces is, but, but really to make something out of not very much. The entry to the boardroom and the boardroom, the, the main dais, it's a very small uh, room that seats about 40 or 50 people uh, for small public meetings. This is the future river walk. Right now it's a drainage ditch, but <laughs> one never knows. Paul Warshaw from Architectural Record did manage to take a great photograph of that. Those were kind of transitional projects in the understanding of centralized space. The next three projects are three very, very centralized spaces. And we see as, as a sort of series of houses uh, a house for a family, a house for a community, and finally a house for a city, which have been an exploration that we've done for the last few years about, about highly symmetrical, cross-axial, centralized plans. Uh, the first of these, one of our favorite projects, is a house in the West Indies. We were very strongly influenced by the kind of characteristic architecture that we found there, this kind of accretion of little pavilions done that way so that uh, they, could, they could be, if, if somebody squatting on a piece of land had to move their house, they could easily take this little 12 by 16 unit and move it someplace else. Or if it blew away in a hurricane, it didn't make too much difference. This uh, very, very basic air conditioning system, you open a window or you close a window, 
the sense of, or the transformation of the British colonial uh, architecture into a kind of characteristic architecture of the islands, and a very strong color palette of, of, um, of deep, of, of bright pastel vibrating complements. The site for the house was rather extra extraordinary, partway up uh, uh, a mountain on Nevis Island and overlooking the Caribbean on the one side, looking up the mountain on the other. The clients, a family from Vermont, maple syrup farmers in the wintertime, uh, Tom and Debbie Talbot and their daughter Jemima, <laughs> had plans to spend the summer growing uh, citrus fruits on, on the estate that they, or the land that they'd gotten. They also had a very strong sense of the family that somebody is first a member of the family more before being an individual. So the plan of the house very strongly reflects that. That is that the main living spaces are the center. You move through the living space and out to the, the pavilion bedrooms and kitchen. And there's a very strong sense, very strong sense of the center. There's the cross axes that pick up on on the uh, possibilities for cross ventilation, and once again, an interpretation and elaboration of the kind of island color palette. The, in this case, using a different complementary uh, uh, set for each of the flanking pavilions, and keeping the central pavilion in a kind of low-key Victorian uh, dark red, dark green. And, uh, the islanders see these colors of the flanking pavilions as being uh, happy colors and welcoming colors, and uh, we certainly wanted to impart that sense to it. Here you can see Nevis Peak called Nevis because when Christopher Columbus first saw it, the top was always in the clouds as if it was uh, snow-capped. Uh, in fact, it's a kind of lenticular effect from the prevailing breezes that means that there is always breeze blowing uh, down the hillside or up the hillside. And the four pavilions and the central mass uh, are able to pick up on any direction of ventilation. Here you can see from the uphill side, uh, Jemima at four o'clock and five o'clock in the morning with her cow's pancake and buttermilk. <laughs> and the sense of that we found down there. We didn't do any working drawings for this. It was just a set of basic documents, design development documents, sketches on the back of envelopes, and a lot of conversations with the contractor and the builders who really knew what they were doing. The stones were collected from the site. The windows uh, and doors and woodwork were cut on the site by hand without power tools and planed by hand uh, to make the windows. If, if it took somebody a day to make a window, nobody worried too much about it. The uh, approach is up the broad stairs to the broad front porch from the kitchen looking into the master bedroom done in greens and, and uh, reds. One of the side porches with the uh, trellis work for shading. The central pavilion, uh, which looks out in all four directions, and because when the house was built, there was no electricity uh, there, we designed this kerosene lantern system counterbalance so it could be lowered uh, for the frequent refilling of the kerosene. The craftsmanship really is just is amazing. Not in a, sen a sense that it's a kind of logical, structural uh, uh, conclusion that you would make. And normally, you would brace the four diagonals, but it's the kind of logical, spatial conclusion that you would make in a square room, which they did without any prompting from us. Each of the four rooms, as I said, the four flanking pavilions done in its own complementary system with a, um, a cornice of stencil work of local f variations of local flowers, Jemima's room, and our favorite room, the visitor's room. All in all, one of our favorite sites and projects. The second of the projects which uh, utilizes a very strongly centralized scheme is a house for a community, uh, Rivercrest Country Club in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which is, it was the, another breakthrough for us, a very large uh, budget 
relatively large budget, a very complex program and a beautiful site where there had previously been for to going three generations back this kind of craftsman style clubhouse, very, very nice with verandas that were eventually closed in. But by the 1950s, this, has been, this had been totally encrusted within what we call Doris Day Monticello, uh, <laughs> an architecture of funeral homes and uh, Ramada inns. And uh, as luck would have it, the whole thing burned to the ground. <laughs> We had a very specific charge from the clients, though. They had, they had pulled the uh, membership. They wanted a colonial building. And we went through the, the, the initial uh, variations. Just to remind you from the beginning of the talk, uh, in this case, four separate ways of organizing the complex program, which address site issues, program issues, and most importantly, the issue of how the uh, central kitchen can serve directly a very large number of dining rooms. Um, after, the, after long talks with the building committee and the membership, uh, we came up with this very centralized scheme which plays on the four axes, uh, two existing fairways which terminate on the site, an ex existing swimming pool which happens to be on the same axis, and an axis of entry on the other side. And we organized around the periphery, but in the center, the most difficult uh, organizational part of the building, the kitchen, directly serving all the dining rooms and service also from below. And then for us, the, the thing that finally became the resolution of the diagram, uh, the ballroom above. And it's the resolution because even though there was an opaque or solid center to the building, which prevents one from sensing the center on the main floor, we were able to section the building in such a way that the landscape and the terraces step on up over the kitchen, in a sense, and up to the ballroom, which really becomes the centralized space where one perceives the four directions. Uh, the material palette, um, a base of rusticated concrete with, uh, with green tile banding set within it, uh, Endicott brick with terracotta, uh, um, uh, string coursing through it, and a cornice and roof of special terracotta sections. And you can see here in an early model the sense, uh, the very strong cross axial sense, the sense that the four uh, directions between the corner pavilions each have a different character and each face in a different direction. Uh, in this very early model, looking at the, the way openings would cut into that. Uh, very tentatively in black construction paper. Believe it or not, this is the same model at a much later stage. Um, as Bob said, the models are evolutionary and experimental and, and part of an investigation. Um, and we don't build models only to show the client, but, uh, but principally to study the design possibilities. Uh, and as Bob said, the models get very large scale. This model, which looks at the vertical layering of the lobbies, the three lobbies, the members lobby, the main lobby, and the, the uh, lobby to the ballroom. And eventually a model like that may get extended or, or may grow by accretion to include other spaces from which, for instance, we can draw perspectives like this where Fred and Ginger are demonstrating the ballroom. In point of fact, um, we don't do very good drawings and we we hate to lay out perspectives, but once you have a model, it's easy to photograph it and to make a perspective from that. I hope I didn't give away any secrets or undercut anybody's curriculum here. Or this one also made from a model and from photographs of the landscape with, with Arnold hitting one into his friends at the uh, men's tavern. Each of the faces of the building, as I said, has a different kind of aspect and a different treatment from the exterior the main entry on the west side, the uh, so-called mixed couples on the south side facing the pool, the men's tavern on the uh, right-hand side of this slide facing out number uh, 13, depressed courtyards which get you down to that service layer underneath, and on the uh, coming in on number 18, the formal dining room, and incidentally, 
a, a, a deck system which covers the uh, service area so that 18 wheelers can pull in there relatively unobtrusively. And then looking up at the upper level, the stepping up of the terracing around the ballroom, the terracotta with the, the terracotta cornice with openings for, the, for mechanical ventilation, the combination of materials at the base condition, the real transition between the base and the central part, and the uh, special terracotta sections that we designed used both in the, in the middle part and the upper part of the building. We also had the opportunity for the, for the first time to design things such as light fixtures uh, that work into the general design of the building, in this case, continuing that string course profile on around through the light fixtures. Within, uh, we were fortunate to be able to do some of the interior spaces, not all of them. The mixed couples, great name. I mean, for the most part, the men and the women are separate, but in certain rooms, they can come together as couples which uh, is reminiscent, we think, uh, and also from a kind of early investigation we did with the club members of certain images from, uh, from Lutchen's work. The main staircase, where we were really able to get into uh, uh, complex uh, uh, um, paneling of wood surfaces. And finally, the ballroom, the central space, with four alcoves, which open up in the four directions. So there are any number of possibilities for giving parties for you know, 30 to 500 people. And that's really what that country club's all about. Finally, the last of the, the kind of cross-axial symmetrical schemes which talk about a center, uh, and I promise the last one of these, is the City Hall for Corpus Christi. And in this case, once again, an investigation of the different types a courtyard, or a three-armed courtyard, a linear building, which would be able to extend in one direction or two directions, and a courtyard on the corner of the site. All in all, though, the uh, clients very strongly like the, the connection of the cross-axial scheme, and you can see through various stages, of the connection of that with the kind of Texas courthouse, which uh, in every county courthouse of Texas, you see this very strongly uh, uh, four-way cross-axial scheme. We've used in the, in the base of the building, the cross-axes form public concourses for the various public functions and, uh, and, and with a central atrium which goes all the way through the six floors of the building and as we go up the building, the, the cross-axes being reflected in the organization of the building and also in this kind of top mass at the, at the, at the peak of the building. That uh, central atrium cuts all the way through, brings uh, some degree of light down into the center of the building, and uh, some sense, wherever you are in your office, of what is the center. Some early studies of the council chamber, <coughs> and some studies of the exterior treatment, once again, various colors and patterns being used to accentuate the conceptual parts of the diagram, the forearms of the cross axis, or the, uh, uh, the uh, mass of the offices above. And finally, two projects which we're doing right now and which are in a very basic state, but which we think point to further directions a further development of these ideas, and in fact are really combinations of the things you've seen so far. The first is a very large 850,000 square feet of use space, mixed use development in Austin, Texas, uh, with a very dramatic site on the side of a hill. Uh, we went through the whole interview process uh, only to find out that they told us, well, you can do the competition now. And we didn't, they never told us, and we didn't realize that we were interviewing for a competition, an invited competition. We don't like to do competitions because it doesn't allow for the kind of client input that we really, that we really need and like. Uh, but it was a very short amount of time, a very large amount of money, and we figured if we wasted the first two weeks, we'd come out really great. And it didn't matter if we won the competition or not. Uh, we did this, we organized it, we organized it in a general sense, in a linear manner, and incidentally, the developers are called linear, linear development. 
uh, punctuated as you move along with a series of nodes or centroidal buildings alternating with centralized lower courtyard spaces that are off that central spine. Uh, there are six office towers in this scheme, uh, 200,000 square feet of retail space and a hotel which, for which the inspiration really was the, the West Baden Hotel at French Lick, which we saw a couple of years ago. We uh, refer to that as the Wiesbaden Hotel, but it's, if you haven't seen it, you should really go down to French Lick and take a look at it. It's not used as a hotel anymore. That two years ago is a flea market, but it's this uh, three or 400 foot diameter drum covered with a glass roof and really spectacular space. In any case, that's what we saw for this round hotel building. And um, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> that slide was backwards, so then I turned it upside down. Um, but a front, very much like the YWCA, with, with thicker elements, which form the kind of wandering dado line that steps up to form entryways to the office buildings and to the shopping complex. On the other side, facing Austin, uh, the stepping down of the hillside and the individual articulation of the different buildings and courtyards. And this uh, uh, recent false perspective model of something of the character of that central courtyard. Well, much to our surprise, we won the competition. And we've gone on to do another building. Uh, uh, this building is, is entering working drawings right now for the same developer, a 220,000 square foot office building, once again in Austin. But in this case, with, the, with a 35 foot height limitation, which meant that the, the 220,000 square feet stretches out to more than 1,000 feet long. But in order to keep the building uh, and means a very large scale on the freeway side. On the other side, however, there's a series of courtyards, auto courtyards, auto entrances, which starts to break down the scale of the building so that one can read it either as uh, a linear building or as, as a mass building with these kind of centralized spaces cut out of it, each of the spaces having a different character. There are two floors of parking, split level parking underneath, two floors of office above, the courtyards being kind of short-term parking areas and uh, 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 kind of concealed entrances into the main parking structure beyond uh, a, each courtyard with a, with a different kind of facade treatment within. We hope a different character within each courtyard, uh, giving a kind of individuality and sense of, of entry for the people who use that section of the building. This is still very much in a state of, of being studied. It's fast track, uh, the column grid is determined, the structure is determined, and we're working on the exterior treatment. Well, what we'd like to leave you with, if nothing else, is the sense that uh, architecture is something that's very complex, but which can proceed from very simple ideas. For us, the most important thing is the conceptual understanding of a, of, a, of a problem in such a way that uh, all of the complex and contradictory forces that act upon it uh, can also be accommodated and enrich the, the, the diagram. You start with something very simple, something very abstract, but something which you know has the possibilities for accommodating uh, everything that comes. And then through the process of, of resolving all of those conflicting forces and uses, and desires, uh, a building goes from being a conceptualization to an actuality. And for us, that's really the joy of architecture. Thank you. bit late. Are there any questions? If there are none, I'm sure uh, these two gentlemen would be happy to speak with you later. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank our special guests, and I'd like to thank Bob and Danny for their commitment and dedication to our profession. It's an inspiration to all of us. Um, your trip here was 
Well, John is in, in back in the office. They won't admit this, but he's back there turning down commissions so that they could afford to come here, I think. Um, I'm really glad we had you visit us. It's, um, it's been too long. We waited to have you. We hope to have you back again real soon, and we thank you very much. Yeah, we're going to get him here sooner than that next time. Thank you.